Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of In the Prague Seat. It's Tuesday night. We're talking Prague. We've got in the co-captain's chairs tonight, we've got Mr. Eric Porter from upstate New York. We got Stephen Reed from Scotland, George Lemay, and Louis Nasser from Chicago. And our very special guest tonight is filling in for Anthony Ferraro. You know him from the Hudson Valley Squares and the Monsters Den, the king himself, Mr. Chris Allo. Hey, everybody. It's a, it's, it is an absolute honor to, to be here with you guys, because you guys really know music. I'm just an idiot. So this is a, an absolute uh, pleasure. We, we have been getting requests for, from so many people, and as well as the panelists themselves, to figure out a way to get Chris Allo on in the prog seat. And Chris is always fighting, because he's like, I don't know enough about prog. I don't know enough about oh, prog. He has then, thrown out some crazy topics. He's like... <laughs> We're favorite and, and most disliked prog record. Like, dude, I don't know. Like, I couldn't tell you. And I'm like, there's, I, I can't do 50 years of research in the next three days, so f- forget it. However, he, <laughs> however, for run. tonight's topic, tonight's topic, I, I, feel, I, I work. There you go. So tonight's topic is uh, all about Rush. And we're going to talk about, we're going to start doing a little series uh, every couple of weeks here on the prog seat of favorite and least favorite albums from some pretty high profile bands. The first episode, we decided to do Rush. Chris is a fan of Rush, as are everybody else here on the panel. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So we're each going to be uh, talking about our favorite album from Rush, talk a little bit about the album, why it's our favorite, and then we'll backtrack around and we'll each give you our least favorite album. So uh, seeing as it's his first time on in the proxy, we're going to let Mr. Allo go first with his favorite Rush album of all time. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Pete. Again, thanks everybody for allowing me to be on here. I am definitely the low guy on the totem pole because you guys are all unbelievably talented as far as being musical experts. Uh, But yeah, I definitely, I dig Rush, have every record, seen them 30 something times, was able to interview Getty Lee once, but I was definitely a late bloomer when it came to Rush. I know I, I mentioned it to Pete on another episode, uh, you know, when I was like 12-ish or whatever, 13, I got into hard rock and metal, but it wasn't until I was like 16 where I got into Rush, and I had a friend who uh, was a huge punk rock fan, and he gave me like a box of like metal albums that he didn't want anymore, and there was uh, some Sabbath and ACDC and I think some Zeppelin, a bunch of assorted stuff, but he had two albums in there, or two tapes rather, 2112 and moving pictures. And I know I had told Pete this before, and I, I mentioned it when we were doing a show with the great Martin Popoff. And I was like, you know, to me, Rush were like, like these pop rock guys. Like I knew big money from like the MTV video countdown show, like MTV top 20 videos. But I'm like, you know, the guitar player looked like he had the same same haircut as the dude from uh, Flock of Seagulls. And he had, he had like a, uh, like one of them skinny 80s ties and the singer just had he had like a little ponytail tied back and they were they were like dancing and he had like a one of them skinny bases like they just looked weird it was like poppy stuff like I didn't like it but then I played 2112 and moving pictures and I was like whoa what the fuck I was like this is this is unbelievable I was like this is both records completely blew me away but the one that I absolutely gravitated to more and uh, stuck with me was moving pictures. Uh, I mean, I, I wore that thing out, you know, I've had to buy it multiple times. Of course, there's, you know, multiple versions of it out there now. Sorry, Pete, I, I wanted to go to the garage to, to dig them out, but it's like five degrees out. I'm like, screw that. So I'm not going out to the garage. And you weren't willing to, uh, to like brave Antarctica to get to the six versions of them. Uh, absolutely absolutely not. I, I dug up my, uh, well, my CDs for last night's show. I'm like, I can't go out there. I'm too, I'm too, I'm too delicate. But uh, but yeah, moving pictures, man. I don't know what more could be said. Uh, you know, I mean, it's one of those albums. Like lots of people say, oh, this is a perfect album. I mean, holy shit, moving pictures is without a doubt a, a perfect album. Only seven songs, and I know Pete. I think you mentioned it last night about you know somebody mentioned it last night about albums having just too many fucking songs. You can't make that many great songs anymore. There's not enough hours in the day. So seven songs, every one of them is absolutely incredible. Uh, Witch Hunt was my personal favorite, still my my favorite uh, Rush song because it was so dark and so heavy. 
and uh, I'll, I'll save my part for the for the for the worst. But I just kept thinking, wow, what happened to this band? Like they did this awesome stuff, and now they're like poppy. But we yeah, have moving pictures, an amazing record, uh, a life changing record. And uh, yeah, Rush are just an amazing band, and uh, that's to this day one of my one of my, without a doubt one of my top ten favorite uh, albums of all time. Cool. All right, we got one moving pictures here for uh, the best. Uh, Eric, what do you got for your favorite? Well, I I started. This was another episode I felt like I didn't have to do a lot of homework for, and I don't know what the median age of this group is, but Pete, I know you and I are the same age, and in high school. When this came out for me, I was in 10th grade, I think. Um, it was ACDC Back in Black and Moving Pictures. That was the soundtrack to my high school. I don't know about you. That's what everybody listened to. And it wasn't because you were a musician. It, and, and the thing about Rush was what transcended that then was I knew people who listened to Rush who didn't listen to anything similar to Rush. But for some reason, Rush connected with them. So I'm going with the same one as Chris um, with moving pictures, because even though I'd heard Rush prior to that on the radio, that was the first album I bought by Rush. And like I said, I mean, any party you went to, any car that's driving by you, you either heard Back in Black or you heard moving pictures blaring some from somewhere. Um, and they are using keyboards. I know they get hammered. Obviously it's much more subtle than what they would do later. This still has so much balls for an album that is using keyboards and not heavily, but they're they're definitely in there. They're very audible. And I think like Chris said, he made the point. I know for me, obviously that first side got played everywhere. Radio played every, I mean, YYZ got played on the radio. And so after hearing those a million times, you're flipping over to side two camera eye is as strong as anything on side one and which hunt probably was the one chris for me i know you said that was your favorite yep. that was probably the one that took me the longest to connect with but in terms of that album there there's really not a bad moment on it um and it's the peak for me that's their peak and it's not to give away anything that's coming later but i i mean they did so much so well and i'm sure now i go back and listen to hemispheres and um, permanent waves and those farewell to kings are probably the ones I listen to the most. But moving pictures made me a rush fan, so that's my favorite. Sentimental favorite is moving pictures. Ooh. All right, two moving pictures. Steven, what do you got? Hmm, <laughs> I've got a funny feeling that I might end up out on a limb this evening. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming, <laughs> nothing too unusual in that, I suppose. So semantics matter here because I went back and checked what you actually asked me to bring tonight. Did you ask me to bring the best Rush album? Well, the best Rush album in my world is a straight fight between Signals, okay, Moving Pictures, and Hemispheres. But you didn't ask me what the best Rush album was. You asked me what my favourite Rush album was. Okay, so my journey began because I also asked, am I allowed to do live albums? I'm not allowed to do live albums. However, my journey began with a show of hands. Back in the day when we all used to copy cassettes and hand them to our friends, we didn't have to buy the same albums. We just, four or five of us would buy one album between us, copy it, share it out. Taping is not killing music because we bought a lot of music. Okay. And I absolutely fell in love with a show of hands. I listened to it all the time. I think I've told the story before where I used to work till three o'clock in the morning when I was 16, when this album came out, walk home, the world to myself with this as my soundtrack and it was the perfect soundtrack. So the friend who copied a show of hands, I said, copy the best album, copy your favorite Rush album. And he gave me this. And I thought, what the hell is this? Because <laughs> that's not this. There's nothing <laughs> like this. I was like, no, no, it was this band I asked for. Where's this band gone? N -n 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 who are these guys? That, that this can't be right. So, of course, he gives me this. 
gives me hold your fire because there's four songs of the show of hands that are on this, but it's not my favourite, okay? Because there's also four songs from Power Windows, okay? And this is my favourite Rush album. It's not the best. I'm not making a case for this being the best Rush album, but it is my favourite Rush album because suddenly everything clicked, it all made sense. And I do love the sound. I love the synths. I love that stark, harsh production. I love, as we discussed on a different prog seat show, I love the immense darkness about the sound of this album, but the amazing brightness of it. I won't have anyone tell me there's no guitars on this album, but when they come out, they make such a presence. They're not there all the time. I mean, Alex, whilst dressed like a banker, is allowed to have a seat somewhere and go and think about things, do you know? discover where the snow dog has gone. I don't know, but you know, he's allowed to go and do that. And every now and again, they wheel him out of the cupboard and they say, play me a solo. So he plays a solo on Marathon, which is absolutely outstanding. It's absolutely brilliant. And you've got Manhattan Project, you've got the big money. So these are the tracks that were on a show of hands. And you've also got Mystic Rhythms. Now, as someone back at this stage who had aspirations of being a drummer, I love the sounds, I love the triggers, I love the bizarrely high-pitched snare. I love all of the things everybody hates because this is where I came in. This is my rush. This is the rush that I got to know that I spent hours and hours listening to. And only then did I realize that actually the best stuff had already happened, but my favorite stuff was happening at that stage. So my favorite Rush album is Power Windows. There you go. I had a feeling that was coming. <laughs> as long as you didn't say the, the red album, then we're, then we're good. So. No, well, I teased. I did tease. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that would be a step too far. <laughs> now, Power Windows is, you know what? I used to hate Power Windows. I have grown to appreciate that album. It's, it's pretty damn good, I think. It's pretty good. I view it as every prog band at this stage in the mid-80s was absolutely throwing the baby out of the bathwater. They were all, you know, trudging all over their past, changing their sound, going with snazzy keyboard sounds that now sound absolutely terrible. And I still think that Rush are the only ones that got away with it. I would agree. I would agree. Cool. All right, George. Oh. Uh my path. Knowing George, he's going to come out and say he hates the, the, the ones that we all pick, and he's going to pick some <laughs> totally left field, right? No, no. No? Okay. Not, not in this instance, right? There's, there's no Court of the Crimson King bastion going on today, right? No, no. Uh, I first saw him on uh, Don Kirshner, actually, on the Promoting Farewell to Kings. Yeah. I liked him, but I wasn't collecting records yet, really. And it kind of took me till moving pictures. I had a kid on my block that played guitar. And he used to go, the shop where he took lessons would let you buy the used records for like a buck. So he bought me a moving pictures. He gave me moving pictures and that was it, man. I heard moving pictures and I was like, same path as most people. Fell in love with the first side, kind of overplayed it. Got to the second side a lot. Grew to love that. Like Eric said, Witch Hunt was a little tough for me, but then I love that too. But then when you love an album like that, you start backtracking on the collection and collecting it. So when I went back, the one I hit on that fell in love with was Hemispheres. Hemispheres, just, I don't know what it was about it. Just the, just love looking at the gatefold and the, the tracks, the heaviness and the progression. And, um, you know, the title tracks, one of the great, great epics. And it's a shame they never did another one that long and that good. Um, yeah, the Circumstances is a neck snapper. The trees I, I thought was so clever then. I just, I remember my mom had a boyfriend and he, he thought the lyrics were the stupidest thing he's ever heard. What's this about oaks and maples, you know? I'm like, it's over your head, man. This is cool. <laughs> and then uh, La Villa, I mean, everybody knows La Villa. That's one of the great instrumentals by a vocal band that there's ever been. So uh, I distinctly remember a time going to the local carnival. They had a hemispheres picture disc and this game where you're throwing darts at a balloon and i spent so much money trying to win that damn thing i never did win it <laughs> annoys the crap out of me but uh yeah i gotta go hemispheres here as good as much as i love moving pictures 
hemispheres is a touch above. I hear that. I hear that. All right. So two moving pictures, power windows, hemispheres. Lewis, what do you got? Well, I am in, in a slightly the same predicament as Steven because my favorite Rush album um, is a live album because that was the first thing I heard. But I'm talking about Exit Stage Left. So I'm not going to mention that because that is out of bounds. But that was the first bootleg tape I ever bought with Rush because I couldn't afford the actual album. So I just got these bootlegs outside the subway in Mexico City. And, um, and later, my friend... My high school friend Ian introduced me to moving pictures, which to me was is was just a mind fuck of epic proportions. It was just so good, and I had never heard a band, three guys, make that that beautiful sound. But much like George, as I began to dig deeper into the catalog, I you know, hemispheres is just unassailable so for me if you ask me you know of the studio albums which is my favorite today and my as a middle-aged guy you know you have this is this is tommy in their catalog and this is who's next and i think that um for me i gotta go with this Everything here is perfectly placed. They are playing, you can hear it, they're playing at the limit of their abilities. There's a little bit of a struggle in everything, right? And this, you know, even though, of course, later they could execute this with a big smile on their face and not even think about it, at the time when they made it, it was a very stressful experience for them, I'm sure. And you can hear it. Was, I think even in that documentary, one of them, whether it was Getty, I remember them saying that like it was almost yeah. like this was beyond us like it, it, we it were... sounds it sounds like they're, it's, it's like they're gonna yeah. fall off the edge of the cliff and i remember I, hearing I something that. like that i love it I, I i i gotta go with hemispheres for this episode yeah well you know if you read uh, martin popoff's uh first rush book he did the three-part series uh, when they when he has the chapter on hemispheres the guys talk about how that album almost killed them Right. I mean, they basically let it all on the line and excruciating number of hours in the studio to the point where they finally got done with that album. They released it. They're like, we're never doing this again. <laughs> yeah. And it that's why like everything that. going forward is completely different. It sounds like that. And it's it's uh, it's I love it when somebody pushes themselves out of their comfort zone that far without deliberately trying to sound like they're not themselves. Yeah. So it's, this, this is the extreme version of the band they were at the time. I absolutely love it. So but they were heading that direction. Caress of Steel started yeah. it all. And then 2112, the Farewell of Kings, you knew they were going there. And then once they got there, we're like, all right, we just did all this. I, we got to do something else. We can't do it. But that. they got there. That's the thing I love. They got there. Yep. And they, they didn't fall off the edge. They they just they were hanging by their fingernails, but they they got there. And I love this record for that reason. Yeah. No, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. So as for mine, um, you know, it's funny because I did some, you know, when we do shows like this, it's sometimes really hard for me because I've already done like ranking the album shows on a lot of these bands. So a lot of times I'm like, all right, here we go again. And in many cases, I did that ranking show six months ago, a year ago, two years ago. And I'm always left thinking, do I feel the same way about these albums that I did back then? Right. Because as many of you know, your opinions change slightly on a lot of this stuff especially with bands you love, right? So today I was sitting there thinking, I'm like, all right, do I just go with kind of what I said a year and a half ago, right? And then I stopped and I was thinking, well, I could do that. But what has been like my favorite Rush album in real recent times? What have I been listening to most? And I was like, well, I listen to a lot of Farewell to Kings these days. I listen to Crest of Steel quite a bit because I have a renewed love for that album. And I, I hate when I hear people shitting on that album because I think it's a brilliant album and it never got the, the credit it, it's due. Um, I've been listening to a lot of 2112, a ton of hemispheres and a ton of permanent waves. And then I thought more about it and I'm like, 
I still have a hard time <laughs> going against the grain with this one. I have a yeah. really hard time with it. It's a even perfect though, record, right? It really is. And it's like, even though I may not listen to this as much anymore, the more I thought about it, the more, you know, because even, I mean, a couple of you guys said it perfectly, you know, back when we were younger, when this album first came out, and I agree with Eric, because back when this came out, you had this, you had Back in Black and maybe a couple other albums. And that's all it was played for like two years straight. And I, I, I actually was into Rush before this came out. I the first album I ever bought was uh, All the World's a Stage. Loved it. Got yeah. Hemispheres, got Farewell of Kings, got Permanent Waves, got 2112. And I really like I really enjoyed it. But it wasn't until this came out that I became a fanatic about this band. And I l- listened to this exclusively for a long time. But I found I was always listening to Tom Sawyer, Red Barchetta, YYZ, and Limelight. And because all four of them were all over the radio, they played all four of them live in concert. They're still great songs. But I kind of ignored side two to an extent. I really liked Witch Hunt a lot, though, because it was heavy, right? Dark, whatever. But Camera Eye, and I hated Vital Signs at the time. Now, all these years later, I almost never listened to the first four songs. And I love side two. Yeah, Camera Eye is a great epic. It's brilliant. I still love Witch Hunt. I happen to think Vital Signs is a terrific song. And what was I thinking back then? Probably because like, ah, it's kind of got this weird reggae thing going on. I'm like, ah, I don't really dig it. Now I'm like, Vital Signs is such a cool song. Yes. It's such a cool song. And I love the production. I mean, Terry Brown, great job on this album. Love the guitar tones, love the drumming, love the bass playing, love the vocals. The songs are, every one of them is so memorable. I have a really hard time going against this one. As much as I maybe listen to some of the other ones more, um i will say this is great and just to throw it out there i've been i've also listened to a ton of signals lately and grace under pressure love both those albums and the last one that they ever did so i i've been listening to a lot of rush over the last year um and i've grown even some of the albums that i never really cared for all that much i can i can find something to like in most of them more on that coming soon so yeah uh moving pictures is my pick for favorite and with that back to mr allo Okay, cool. So, hey, yeah. Okay. Just one second. Uh, I was instructed by Mr. Ferraro. He couldn't make it. Oh, that's right. Yeah. What's Anthony's pick? Yeah. Well, I mean, to tell all the viewers that his pick is Permanent Waves on the on the strength mostly of Jacob's Ladder. He's a huge Jacob's Ladder fan. So, cool. Permanent Waves for Anthony. Yeah, that's a, a great pick. I, I can't argue that at all. Permanent Waves is amazing. I just I wish Permanent Waves was a little longer. It's yeah. Very, very brief album. But yeah, it's a good pick. Good thing. All right, Chris, now back to you. Okay, cool. Yeah. So it's, it's 1987. My, my friend Albert gave me this, uh, you know, these bunch of these albums, like I said, some of what you had, but Rush was a new thing for me and fell in love with it. So I start going back and, you know, it was tough back then trying to afford records being a kid, but I was doing what I could. And, um, but I was, you know, I was a pretty experienced metal fan at the time for being 16. You know, I was going into the clubs in the city to see, slayer and possessed and and all these crazy bands and i was friends with another kid at school who was really into rush and he's like hey you know they they have a new record he's like you know i can i can make you a copy of it i will I love, sort of like like steven was saying before which yeah that that's what you did back then i had tons of cassettes until you could go buy the real thing so i was like okay yeah sure he's like yeah actually they just came through on this tour and he's like, they were great. And he was telling me all about it. I was like, okay, cool. So he makes me the tape and I go home and listen to it. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Like, this is worse than big money. And it's, it's, uh, what the fuck is the name of the record? Uh, it just jumped out of my head. The one with the three red balls. Yeah, that's it. Hold, Hold your fire. fire. Hold your fire. And I listened to it like four times yesterday. I'm like, does this suck as bad as I remember? And I'm like, oh, it could be worse. I'm like, like, what the fuck is going on? It is so happy and poppy. And, you know, I could see as I'm listening to it, I could see Getty Lee hopping on one foot. And I'm like, I don't like this. This is not what I want from Rush. I'm like, and I could see, you know, Alex with the little shoelace necklace or shoelace tie. And I'm like, this is fucking terrible. I mean, listen, Time Stand Still is a great pop song. But it's a pop song. I mean, if I want to listen to like pop I'll, in 1987, I'll listen to like Madonna or Tiffany. I was like this. I thought it was absolute garbage. Uh, I listened to it again, you know, three or four times. The mission is the one I like. I laugh out loud. I mean, it's it's a great pop song, but this is not, you know, uh, progressive hard rock. 
at all. I mean, you guys would know better than me, but I still think this album is awful, uh, and I, I fucking hated it. And it's almost, it almost derailed me. It was so bad. I was like, oh, like, do I keep being a Rush fan if this is the new stuff that they're doing? Because this is, this is awful. But being the, you know, it, they sucked me in so much. I went and I got the, in a short, you know, whatever it was that year, I got the whole catalog and I saw them on the Presto tour and I thought they were amazing and they were. So that sucked me in for life. But man, a hold your fire, I just think is still just, just terrible. That that's that the mission. <laughs> uh, every time I hear it, I'm like, what? Like this is just it's just terrible. And no offense to anybody that likes it, because I'm sure somebody likes it. Uh, probably like oh, like Stephen. See, see, there we go. Who, who so, invited uh, you on in the proxy? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's no hold your fire was definitely not at war with Satan. So uh, I was just like, like I said, it almost you know proved me not to be a fan anymore but but i i held tight and and uh yeah but yeah that's it's pretty bad all right one one vote for uh hold your fire so uh eric which direction you all right going? well i live in saratoga new york and i thought as i was thinking about the records that i don't like from rush i'm going to use some Saratoga is famous for horse racing. So I'm going to use some uh, horse racing jargon. And Lewis, I'm going to steal something from you. So I'm going to, I'm kind of where Chris was talking about where I really lost interest in them at a certain point. And it actually was Hold Your Fire. I wasn't a big fan of Power Windows. I'm still not. Um, but I have, and Lewis, you always use this. So I'm going to steal this from you. I have a trifecta of turds that I had to choose from. And that was Hold Your Fire, Presto, and Roll the Bones. So going with the Saratoga theme, if I was gonna put a box set out for Rush of those three records, it'd be called the Gelding Years because they lost their balls. Literally, yeah. there's, there's no balls to any of those records. It's fine, I, I should, I'll take that back. Uh, show Don't Tell was probably the only song I felt that had some balls to it. So this was tough because, and they're right in a row. Um, I bought them, I, do, I don't own them any longer. I sold them, um, but if I had to pick the worst of the three, to me, it's Roll of Bones. And I just feel like that record, I think this era they're lost, but I think with that record, I don't feel any energy in that record. It just feels like they're going through the motions to me. And I, I went back and listened to this a couple times. And literally, after a day, I can maybe conjure up what is it, Dreamline, the opener, and the, um, the title track is the stupid rap. And whoever thought that was a good idea to put that on the record. The fact you did. I mean, right there alone, that should be the reason it's the worst record in their catalog. Who told them to do it and who approved it? Uh, you know, the whole thing. Um, but those three for me were absolutely awful and Roll the Bones, I think, is the worst of the three. So that's my least favorite Rush album. The Dreamline is a great song, I think. Uh, yeah. That's about the only one that sticks in me, except for having to hear that rap in my head in Roll the Bones. And everything yeah, else is forgettable. Bad. I can't. I remember the first time I heard the title track, I was like, what yeah. in the world is this? <laughs> awful. Yeah. All right, so we got one vote for Roll the Bones. So we got a Hold Your Fire, Roll the Bones. Steven, what do you got? Well, there were only two real contenders for me uh, for my least favorite, because evidently I don't dislike any Rush albums because I like the ones that everybody else doesn't like. So there you go. Um, I thought about the debut album, but it's a great album. It just doesn't sound like Rush, but it's a great album. So it, it wasn't really in contention. But what was in contention was Vapor Trails. I just think it's a bit lifeless. I just don't really enjoy it very much. I never have. However, there are some good songs on here. One Little Victory is good. Ghost Rider is good. But the sound is rubbish. However, any band that does refine their balls, okay, and admit a mistake to the extent that they'll give you another option 
to go and listen to it and go, actually, this is all right. This yeah. is nothing like as bad as I thought it was. I take my heart off to them because how many big bands will admit it? a mistake like that? Not very many. So it left me with the one that I actually couldn't find. And the reason I couldn't find it is it's because the only Rush album in the whole catalogue that I haven't gone and bought on CD. So I'm left with Presto. Now, I like Rush at this era. I like what's come before. I quite like Roll the Bones. Okay, these are this is my kind of entry point into the band, but this is a compromise album. This is um listening to people going, you're playing pop shit. That's what you're doing. Where is the prog? Where are the guitars? We'll, we'll, we'll bring some of it to this. But it doesn't have the sheen of what's come before. And it doesn't have, at least Roll the Bones has got some oomph about it, or I, I think it does anyway. And this just really show don't tell is good the past is good i don't hate this album in any shape or form but it is the one that i evidently don't play very often i mean i do play my vinyl but i tend to buy things on cd if i really want them i want to listen to them a lot and i genuinely thought i had this on cd and i'm looking backwards and forwards and <sighs> I, I know the feeling. This. and the answer is i obviously never bought it on cd so i've still got the faithful vinyl which is in remarkably good condition because it hasn't been played very much. So there you go. My least favourite is Presto. So we're only a few years after my most favourite. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question of you guys? Yeah. Um, I bought Vapor Trails and I sold it. Is the remix really that? Does it make a huge difference? It does. Yeah. yeah. Does it? I, the, the guy I, I, all of these years ago who was copying these cassettes for me, who is still a good friend of mine. Uh, and still a massive Rush fan. When he listened to this, he was like, no, it's, it's rubbish, it's absolute garbage, it's, it's just terrible. I said, you need to go and listen to this. He was like, that can't improve it. That's the, the, there's, It's not good enough for a simple remix to improve it. He admitted he was wrong. It's that much better. I, I've always been an apologist for Vapor Trails, and, and the reason, I think, is that at least for Neil, the band was done. And he was done with the band. He was done with life. He, he had to re, rediscover a purpose. And um, when they put that record together, I think that it was, it, it has, it captures the sound of that anger. Yeah. It's, it's harsh. It's, it, face, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's, it's almost claustrophobic. It's like being caught inside a metal cylinder, which is what, what depression and extreme sadness does to you. And I, and I always found it to be a very powerful statement. Plus, I remember when they did the tour for that record, the show that I saw, they kicked it off with Tom Sawyer. So they could say to the people who were there, if you came to hear this, you can get the fuck out now. <laughs> and I love that. Because prior to that, they were always, it was more phoned in. It was more like, a, you know. So I, I've always loved that record, but I, and I've never actually heard the remix because I, for me, it's part of the whole experience, the fact that it's so, like, you know, ugly. It, it kind of makes songs like The Ghost Rider or Earthshine. It gives them a different kind of edge. But um, but I understand perfectly why, you know, objectively you can say, well, this sounds like fucking garbage, right? The only way you can sound worse is if you, if you, if you clip on the St. Anger track with the harmonics <laughs> and, the snare and do shit like that. So I understand. But I, I am still, I defend that record for that reason, just in general, you know. And I will add as well for Vapor Tales that the tracks that they played live just come alive in a different way entirely, that, that they make total sense live. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I always thought the songs were good there. I just, the, yeah. man, that, the mix on that first release was just like, oof. But yeah, uh, yeah Eric, Eric, I would say definitely check out the remix on that. Okay. I, I think it's just, it's night and day when you listen to the two of them. Mm -hmm. All right, George, how about you? Well, they're probably my favorite band at the time in the whole world at the point of uh, right around moving pictures. When Singles comes out, it, it, as much as I like it, it sounds different. And, so, and Grace Under Pressure is kind of a twin to it. I like both of those albums a lot. When Power Windows comes out, it takes another step towards that production sound, the Simmons drums, uh, the t more jangly guitars, but the songwriting is still good. I was still there for that, more or less. 
Well, when Hold Your Fire came out, nah, man. <laughs> Force 10, I like it. Uh, then Time Stand Still, to me, is a very overrated track that if it wasn't for Amy Mann, nobody would remember. But after that, the Blandathon starts. It's just a morass of dated production sounds. And uh, yeah, the Simmons drums are to the max. And the mix has got the depth of a waiting pool. It's just, there's no meat on the bone. And all the way to the end, the last couple tracks, I forget what the last track is, but the one before it, Tai Shan, that might be my least favorite Rush song. Right there with Ribbon Bell. China does not speak to you, George. Oh, God. It's just, I couldn't mention how, like, how is this Rush? I just, but even if it wasn't Rush, I still don't like it. It's not good for anything. So for me, I have the same trio as Eric. Those three albums, I don't like any of them, but Hold Your Fire is extra special bland for me. All right. Lewis. All right. So I have a story to tell about Hold Your Fire, which is why it's not my, my least liked album. Um, I, had to, I found myself, so when it came out, I had to take a bus ride from Mexico City to a northern town called Sonora, in Sonora called El Mosillo, the capital. And um, that's a 36-hour bus ride. Oof. Now, for, for people who don't understand what this means in Mexico, the bus driver will make multiple stops to shag some woman or to collect <laughs> edibles or, or to pick up people on the road. So you will be in your seat but uh, the walkway will be filled with old ladies with live chickens and things, right? Wow. And I, I, had, um, I had a Walkman and I had, I had just bought, before I went on this trip, um, Hold Your Fire. And I had another tape. I forget which one, but it, but it got chewed up instantly. So I was left with only the one. So all I could do was listen to Hold Your Fire for the duration of the trip. Woo! And here's what happened. Brutal. <laughs> Torture. This Guantanamo level of abuse. It, it sort of drilled itself into my brain. And momentarily, I felt like China did speak to me. So I can't actually hate it. Although objectively, I can say this is not good. But, but uh, it, it, it just lodged itself in brain in, a, in, a, in, in some way. So... From the, the trifecta of Alex Lifeson's pain, I, I have to choose as my least favorite, Roll the Bones. And, and, and the reason is, I, I agree with, I, I think it was a very insightful comment that, that Presto is a compromise. I had never thought about it like that, but you're absolutely right. Um, however, the songs on Presto that work really work well for me. And I find that I have to really tell myself to like the songs in this one. I, I, have to, I have to do some mental gymnastics to overcome my natural revulsion for this thing. So I, um, I, if I'm just honest, this is a record that I have and it's sitting on my shelf and I never ever play it until I had to do this. And I listened to it again. And I, I once again got the same skin crawling sensation and I didn't really like it, which is only, and again, this, to be clear, my skin crawled because I'm listening to Rush, but it doesn't sound like Rush. Like, I, I think that it's fair to say that Rush's worst moment kicks a lot of bands taint squarely. So that is, that's another thing. I, I um, But for Rush, this is a, for me a low point. And, Lewis, and I think that's a good point too because I think it just feels like they lost their way. I mean, there's they're such yeah. a different sound, and I know you have to, you know, a band that's got a 35 year career, you have to evolve to a certain point. And there's good playing on those records, but even the writing, I, I just I don't know. Those three records are, and like you said, it's yeah. you have an expectation with Rush, right? And people went like George said too. People went with them as they changed. Signals, Grace Under Pressure, they were changing, but people stayed with them. And I, I, I know people still stayed with them. I don't know how anyone can listen to those three records with enjoyment over, like how many times are you gonna go, everyone was talking about Hemispheres. 
you go back and listen to that over and over and over and moving pictures over and over and over. You're sick of those songs and you still listen to them. You're right. These are unlistenable after a couple of times to me. I can't listen to this, those yeah, three anymore. I mean, you know, heresy? No, thank you. The, the, the only thing heretical is that it's actually a Rush song. Um, <laughs> you know, face up, the face down in the mud, shame. Like, I, I, Even don't, that, I, don't, I don't, yeah. Sorry. You say those, it's hard for like, you say Tom Sawyer, and I know that's top shelf, but you'll say songs, you're immediately hearing them. I'm seeing those videos from the studio when they would had the uh, old MTV videos. You say songs on Roll the Bones, I can't even think of what they sound like half the time. They're just gone. They're not memorable. I'm singing along in my head right now. <laughs> <laughs> keep singing, Stephen. Keep singing. I, I am further out on a limb than I realized. Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised that anybody can still see me. <laughs> no, no, but you know, but, but but to be fair to Stephen, I know people that I taught in college who love this record. Absolutely love it. And there are people who, I mean, I actually really, really enjoy Power Windows. I think Power Windows is a misunderstood great album in their in their catalog. But, uh, you know, some people came in with hold your, you know, the hold your fire. Right. It's and generational it's or your point of entry. Yes. You know, then you're listening to, you, you look at the photos of these three guys wearing kimonos when they barely have a beard. And it's just kind of a turnoff also, right? Yeah. So it really depends, you know, I, I get all that. I'm just saying for me, an, an old fart who, who loves this band, this was a, a crushing disappointment. And it, it continues to be. Whereas the other records, I always find, I mean, even here, there's, you know, Where's My Thing, Dreamline, it's pretty good, right? It's, it's fucking Rush. You know, most people can't touch those songs their entire career. But it's it's not the level that we have been made to expect. Yep. So that, that that's my only disclaimer, is that a bad Rush album isn't crap. It's just a crappy Rush album. It's a crap. <laughs> Uh, one thing, Rush really always to me, not always, but eventually the more I dug in, the more I found that a, a, a large majority of Rush fans are not like other rock fans. They are like obsessive and like, I mean, I know some Rush fans that that only listen to Rush, you know, like to listen to another band would be, you know, heresy. To, to, for, I mean, it's crazy. I remember one time, uh, it was in the early 90s, so I don't remember which tour it was, but I went to see Rush at the Garden, and there was some dude who did a fanzine, it was a nice looking fanzine, and he was passing it out. So of course I took it, and coming home from Madison Square Garden, I was reading it on the train, and it had like all the set lists from the recent shows, which were cool, of course they were all the same, but what I thought was, was like beyond obsessive was the guy uh, had word for word what Alex would say each night, like during the encores. And sometimes it was just nonsense. It would just be Alex being like, wubba, 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 wubba. And the guy fucking typed it out word for word. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, what the fuck kind of weirdo fan are you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. But there's a lot of those, you know? And I think another band that has similar is Kiss. But I think Rush... Rush weirdos beat the Kiss weirdos because a lot, you know, like for, for me, Rush fans, they bought whatever shit they were shoveling at them. That's why they did so many crappy records. No offense, Steven, but they, you know what I mean? They just fucking went with it. They just fucking went with it. They bought it. They went tickets to the show. I mean, Roll the Bones was a huge fucking hit. They did like three U.S. tours for that record. I mean, so it is. And I, I remember asking Getty Lee about it and he, he did. He felt very lucky that Rush fans were like that, that no matter what they could do, very loyal. You know, there was a rap, exactly. a country Western, jazz, whatever the fuck, they were doing it and the fans were gonna, were, they were shoveling to the fans and the fans were gonna eat it no matter what. The, and there you've just hit on the difference between a Rush fan and a Kiss fan. Because a Rush fan can have this conversation and say, you know what, well, I don't like Presto very much. But Rush are great. Don't diss Rush, you can't talk Rush down. They're, they're a great band. You speak to a Kiss fan and you say, do you know what? 
I love Kiss, but see that Animalize album, it's garbage. And a Kiss fan will go, yeah, it's shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> And you also have some KISS fans where you have the certain part of, of the fan yes. base who yes, only average, loves yeah. the 70s stuff and hates oh, everything yeah. else. Right. And or I just met quite a few yeah. who only yeah. like the latter period stuff and they're yeah. really not that big on the early stuff. So yeah. oh, and, and and the, amount, fans, of hate, the you know. amount of hate for the current band is off the charts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've heard Rush been called many times as the ultimate people's band. Or well, I was going to say the biggest cult band ever. Biggest cult. Yeah, the band biggest right. cult band ever. There you go. That is no matter what the critics think, say think, yeah. or anything like that. The fan base stays with them to the end. Uh, I think that the rapport between the band and the fans comes through in those films that they showed or showed when they were playing live. For a, a band to be able to get the fans to laugh along with them at the band and therefore at yourselves. How many bands could do that? How many fans of bands would go, well, you know, fuck you. How dare you, you know, stamp over everything that I've cared and loved about all those years. You go to a Rush show, they're taking the piss out of themselves and everyone's standing laughing and pointing and that's me. (laughs) Who can do that? One band can do that. That's Rush. I love, uh, uh, my favorite one of those, I think, is where the, the, uh, this guy is still, I forget his first name, but he's, he's pretending to be a Rush fan. And he says, are they going to play Bangkok? No, they never oh, play Bangkok. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then later, <laughs> later the set, they're playing it, and they yeah. cut the hip, and he's fucking hit banging in his apartment. <laughs> <laughs> it's the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. It's well, amazing. Who, I love that who stuff. brings yeah. uh, washing machines on tour with them and puts them on <laughs> stage, right? Well, but you know, the, uh, that's another thing that's awesome, because he uses the, the Tech 21 Sans app. So he doesn't have apps, actually, at yeah. all. But so he, he just... Um, you know, his sound comes from a little pedal this big. Yeah. So all he needs is he can have T-shirts rolling around. He can throw them at the crowd. At some point, he had rotisserie chickens. I don't even know. They yeah, were the rich. chickens. That's right. But, you know, there's, there's so always they... been things. They're just fucking oh, fun. Yeah. Well, they I was going to say, one, one, one thing, you know, I remember in the, I guess, in the 90s, they kept coming out with the fucking bunnies. You know, the, the magician's hats and the bunnies would pop out. Well, after doing the same gimmick for a couple tours, it was like, all right, guys, this is, this is getting fucking old. At least... At least Iron Maiden changes the Eddie every year, like fucking change it up. And I, 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 I laughed. I don't remember which tour it was, but finally one tour, the they had the two magicians hats and one bunny popped up like normal. But then the other bunny a few minutes later popped up, but it was like a mean looking bunny with a shotgun and it shot a bullet and it hit the other bunny and deflated it. I'm like, all right, that's funny. I was like, that was good, guys. That's the perfect way to kill off these bunnies. That's right. I mean, I loved it as well, as you're saying. I mean, they didn't need all the amps, but the tour that they went out and they had all the amps, a whole wall of amps. And every show that you go and see, it's all about building it bigger. You start small, you build it bigger, you build it bigger, you reveal more, the lights get better, the logo gets bigger. They dismantled the whole set until there was nothing left. There was an amp on a chair. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is, all of this, all of yeah. this is nonsense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's brilliant when you think about it. Yes. All right. So my least favorite was down to two. It was down to hold your fire and presto. So I listened to both of them back to back today. And I was like, all right, I really don't like either of these albums much. But it all came down to, well, which one can I stomach more? And what I found is I there were probably three songs on presto that I kind of dig. And other than... Force 10 on this one. I don't really like anything else on this. I, it's just, it's limp. It's lightweight. I really don't even like the songs to be honest with you. I mean, yeah, Chris is right. They are pretty good pop songs on here, but it's, this is not what I want to hear Rush doing. Yeah. And I like Power Windows. I used to dislike Power Windows quite a bit, but I really enjoy that album now. And I always kind of singled the, these two out and now this one's left standing all by its lonesome. And I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. I just can't get into this album. I really can't. Uh, one song after another, it either is too too lightweight for me or it's just unmemorable. And I just, I don't like the guitar tones on here. There's way too many keyboards. I don't even really think the drumming is all that great on here. I know there's a lot of people that love this album. I just don't. I've tried. I've tried for decade after decade. Uh, I honestly say... 
almost every other Rush album I find plenty to enjoy, and most of the Rush albums I like quite a lot. Uh, this just isn't one of them. I've tried. It's a shitter. Yeah, it is. And Anthony, what did Anthony pick? Anthony's pick is Roll the Bones. Aha. Well, Roll the Bones did pretty well in this exercise. <laughs> <laughs> So how many do we how many do we have for a whole hold your fire? What do we have? Two for this? Three, three for this. How many roll the bones did we have? Three. Three, three for roll the bones. And then uh presto. Oh, so that's interesting. Yeah. Interesting too. It's all in that same era. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Alex Lifeson's pain. That's the trifecta right there. Yeah. 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 Taurus, go sit in the corner. Yeah. The, the third trifecta. I'm gonna remember that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So before we leave, uh, I've, I've heard lots of uh, people talking over the last few months because anytime like any kind of, you know, quote or something comes out of the rush camp about, you know, the guys saying, ah, itching to do new music or maybe we'll work together someday. Then everybody starts talking about, oh, rush is going to come back. Rush is going to come back. They're going to get a new drummer. They're going to do an album. You guys think it's ever going to happen? I think it's done. Yeah. George, no, tell I them what you were thinking, though. I like your idea. My blueprint, if they're going to keep playing together, which I don't mind to keep playing together, these are things you have to do. You can't call it Rush. Right. Getty should not sing anymore. He doesn't sound good anymore anyways. To me on R40, he, he's a down downgrade. No more singing. And don't make it a trio. That just invites comparisons. You yeah. do a quartet with a with a full-time singer, and they want to keep playing together, I'm all, all for it. But you got to get away from as much Rush things as you can. I like that I because that. I think they want to play together, but I yeah. think they're they're in a weird spot because they know that you can't continue this as Rush, and you got to do something completely yeah. different. But think um, of that: all those years together, they did. They, nobody should knock them, but I think George was telling me that idea the other day, and I'm thinking these two guys want to play together. They, not that they'd fade into the background, but like you said, you get a folk. It's always going to get knocked, probably right at some point. But you get a singer or, or a frontman. And I don't know where they are musically. Maybe they would do something that would come out sounding really different. But I get that they, I mean, those guys played together forever. Nobody I'm, should tell them that they can't and they shouldn't feel like they can't. But I have an observation. Tell them that they can't. But the, the question for me is, if they're going to go out in a different configuration and not have Getty sing and not really play Rush songs, is it worth their time and bother to go and play smaller venues and have people go, Tom Sawyer, why was he? Well, if they, that's yeah. what's going to happen. If I, the build up in the press, they keep they put it out there that they're not going to be playing Rush material. Yeah, but that's there's, I, that there's what they tell people, and there's what people expect. Meet and tell everyone they're going to play lots of new songs, and everyone right. goes away. They didn't do the trooper. Yeah, priest yeah. so, priest and I scorpions when, and another band said they were going to retire and never did. Yeah, when, when Opeth came out with that with a more mellow album, and and people were there, and and, and then Porcupine Tree was a headliner, and and people were pissed because they weren't doing the blast beats and the heavy stuff. It doesn't matter how many times you say it; nobody gives a fuck. It's Opeth, and they want to hear the heavy shit. Mm -hmm. For me, I mean, my main thing is if you don't have Neil Peart's writing. I mean, I love Alex Lifeson, but I don't really want to read his words. And I don't, I mean, the, I think that those guys could very easily churn out some incredible fucking instrumental stuff. They could, they could do the thing where they could bring in a, a whole slew of guest drummers to play on different tracks and do different things. Portnoy, Miniman, and, uh, you know, all, yeah, Miniman, all the fucking guys. Portnoy's of the world. They're all going to be lining up to play with them. And, um, and then if they need to go and play live, there is always, you know, Virgil Donati, Mike Portnoy, somebody can do the rounds with them and they can do it. And they can do a mixture of, we're going to play our new shit and then we'll throw some old ones because it's their music, right? They have every fucking right to play it if they want. I'm just I, I think it's just, um, you know, I do agree that you don't want to have, uh, it can't be Rush, right? But it can be whatever they want it to be. And they should play as many of the old songs as they want. Because they're their songs. It's their life, right? They, they, they own these things, right? Who the fuck am I to tell them they can't play them? I think it's more a question of, of um, let's get something that makes sense. I mean, 
instrumentally, they're better than ever, obviously, right? So why not play to your strengths? I agree that the Getty's voice is not awesome anymore. So save your voice for the encore and play some cool shit. You know, maybe if, if you want to bring a singer, bring somebody unexpected. Maybe maybe a girl. Maybe so, something's going to sound really like different. Lady. Yeah, you know? get a hot broad. <laughs> you get a hot broad. She can be ugly as sin, but as long as she sings great, yeah. I'm all for it. And 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 it, it's all right because it's 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 about whatever music they have. I mean, I don't know if you guys like my favorite headache, or if you like the Lifestone solo album. I think the they're synergy is me. where all the magic happens. Yeah, and that's, that's the problem for me, though, is if they're going to go out and do something that's not Rush, they need to come up with something different. And they, they've evolved right. so, through their career. But when they've, on a solo level, gone out and done something a little different, I don't think it was all that great, personally. No. So this so is would why... I rather have what I've got yeah. than compromise with something else? I mean, I don't think that, I guess if, if, if they, if they write some good stuff, right. In today's world, they can leak a couple of songs and get a, get a sense of how people react. You know, it's a little different. And, and, but, and but you yeah. Can't tell me that they haven't been writing. I guarantee you those guys have all sorts of stuff right. that they've been working on either on their, probably on their own, but that they can get together and make something happen. I was gonna say, I remember reading a, an obsessed Rush fan at some show before the pandemic hit, and he was telling me, and I, I don't know, I don't, I didn't verify this, but he was saying that Rush was still under contract for one more studio album to Roadrunner, and that there was some stuff in the can, and they were trying to figure out what to do. I don't, I don't know if there was, if there's any truth to any of that, but that's, that's what I was told by some guy who definitely knew his shit. Wow. Mm. I mean, do, do these contracts last even if a member dies? That's a great point. I mean, this was definitely before, um, you, know, you know, before it's going to be an escape there, valve, so. right? Like the guy's dead. Like we can't right. fulfill this obligation, right? If they wanted, if they didn't want to, you know, yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. I don't know. I guess time will tell, right? But you think some fans <laughs> are going to revolt against them playing rush stuff? Like, that's not for you to play, you know, where's Neil? You can't play without Neil. No matter what, it's not going to sell like Rush did. It's just right. not. That's Neil. right. But maybe they, maybe they'll be happy playing theaters. Well, and, they could, and, and, they could I know I'll be happy seeing them in a the theater instead of a fucking sports arena. I, um, I, I mean, they're, it's their life. People, yeah. people have a right up to a point. Nobody's forcing them to go. Yeah, but they, don't the need, time, they don't need financially, they probably don't need to do anything. And I was going to say no. that too. Whenever, you know, oh. whenever we have one of these debates, you know, the, the, the fan in you is like, oh, yeah, I do it, whatever. But the reality is, these guys are getting older by the fucking minute. I mean, the, the guys in Russia, how old? You know, Alex has how many problems? God knows whatever Getty's got going on. I mean, they're 100 years old. I mean, you know, right. these yeah, guys yeah. are well past their prime. Do they want to be? going on buses and planes and doing interviews again and all that other shit. I, I don't, I don't know. The, but the clock is working against Rush and Priest and Kiss and all these old bands that we all like because you know, their time's running out for all of them. I mean, I, you, you could ask, Pete could have asked the same question about Tony Iommi. Do I want Tony Iommi to do something? Yeah. yeah. You can call Glenn Hughes. He could do some cool shit, right? Totally. Just had that conversation with a buddy of mine on Saturday. He's but, like, yeah, it'd be great if Tony did did theaters and brought out, you know, Tony Martin and Glenn Hughes and, you know, had somebody fill in for, yeah, it's a great, it's a great pipe dream. Is it going to happen? I don't know, man. Tony hasn't done shit in eight years and all he's come out with is a fucking $300 bottle of cologne. So <laughs> That's, that's right. <laughs> I, I don't know. I doubt it. But, I mean, you're right. I mean, would it be cool to see like this Tony Iommi tour kind of like what Shank He's got like, you know, two or three of his uh, vocalists that he's working or, you know, plus a couple extras and just plays greatest yeah. Tony Iommi, right? For totally. You months. could do the same thing with Rush. I said, yeah. get, get, a, get a hot broad, get some other dude to sing some of the, the crappy tracks from the 80s, you know, get a whole bunch of people in the band. Yeah. Wh whoever said it. it. It was a genius idea. But yeah, is it going to happen? I don't know, man. And you know, the pandemic fucks everything up. Yeah. I mean, I saw how many tour announcements today, and I laughed. I'm like, yeah? Are any of these going to fucking happen? Who knows? So who knows? Who knows? Ah, uh, what if? 
So there you have it, everybody. Uh, favorite and least favorite Rush albums. You know the drill in the comments below. Please list your favorite album by Rush and your least favorite album and the reasons why. And uh, type that away down below. We'll be checking it out. And I want to thank everybody here for uh, coming to the show today. All prepared to discuss one of our favorite bands. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Stay tuned in two weeks because we'll be doing this one more time. Well, maybe more after that with another uh, legendary prog band. But till then, uh, for Eric Porter, Chris Allo, George Lemie, Stephen Reed, and Louis Nasser, I am Pete Pardo. See you next Tuesday here on In the Proxy. Have a good one.